Hello and welcome to Stay Paid, the sales and marketing podcast from Reminder Media on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business so you can live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. My name is Joshua Stike and I am joined, as always, by your host with the most... With, Luke Acree. With the most what? Though? I don't know. Just the most action. The most charm. The yeah. most... I don't know. I just thought I'd mix it up. <laughs> I like to mix it up, keep you on your toes, see what you'll say. Yes. You never, Josh never knows what I'm going to say. I'm getting more and more loose. I don't know if you guys go back and listen to our first podcast <laughs> to now. I'm so much more loose. And I promise I'm just drinking a Monster Energy drink. I'm not drinking anything else in here. It's just, but I'm getting a lot more free. Well, if my you, co- I can always tell too, because we have, you guys don't know this, if, you know, from watching the video, but we actually have Andrea and Jesse and then our producer, Mark. In I call it the studio, but it's really kind of like a closet. But in the closet with us, it's a it's an and old video. I can always tell when I say something really loose because they kind of get this cringe on their face. Like, did he just say that? I'm just like, yep, I did. I just said it. That time I talked about like if your baby's dying, you're gonna get resourceful. Yeah, bring it up again. Yeah, yeah, bring it up again to make everybody <laughs> cringe again. It was terrible. But anyways, that's not what this podcast is about. This one's gonna be a great one because we got an expert on it. We do. We have a true expert. Our guest today is Dan Collison. He is the author author of the book, The Financial Advisor's Guide to Excellence. He is a certified financial planner, a member of the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners, and a member of the Financial Therapy Association. So Dan regularly presents workshops and seminars on specialized financial topics to companies and organizations, as well as trains, mentors, and coaches, advisors of all tenure on practiced financial planning and world-class business development strategies to help advisors stay paid in their financial practices. Today, we're going to talk to Dan about uh, pain-free prospecting, among some other things. Dan Collison, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much. Dan, it's great to have you on. I'm excited to have you on because obviously you coach financial advisors. And I have to say this, I'm probably going to offend all of our financial advisors who listen to this. But financial advisors... Every you know, I've had the privilege now of going to conferences, talking to them. They really like to party at conferences. I don't know, Dan. <laughs> have do? you been? Yeah, they like <laughs> they to party at conferences. Well, oh my gosh, you're I not wrong. I cannot keep up. Terrified. I cannot keep up with them <laughs> at, at conferences. But anyways, but they're very you know obviously analytical and yeah. they're very dry. Most of them. I'm being stereotypical here, but I have to be honest. They're super dry. And so when it comes to like my passion is sales marketing, you can just tell by hearing me. Like I'm a you know, more of a visionary or floating person. I'm not very structured, like I'm chasing the shiny things, doing, you know, but they're very like Pragm- professional, yeah, yeah, very, you know, logical. It has to be analytical. Like when I'm pitching a financial advisor, they just want to hear about the numbers. They don't want to hear about the fluff. Yeah. So I'm excited, Dan, to have you on to tell us how have Perfect. you really help financial advisors become marketers, right? Because it, when you're a business owner, you also have to be a marketer. And, and a lot of times, and, and our buddies at White Glove, yes. Dean Thurman, uh, you know, said this, that to be a great financial advisor, first you have to be a great marketer because you could be the best financial advisor in the world, but if no one knows you exist, you, you ain't getting no bit. you're never going to be able to use that skill set. So, And that's absolutely true. And that's, that's the unfortunate thing about the industry because the reality is the financial service industry doesn't hire stupid people, but a lot of those smart people never learn to be marketers or prospectors, and then they fail their way out of the business very quickly. And it's sad because we lose some of the smartest people, but they just don't cut it on the marketing side. No, you're, you're so true. And on the like the real estate side, the statistics are like 87% of real estate agents fail within five years. I heard, now I, yeah. I don't know if I can back this up. Andrew, you can fact check it, see if you can find it on Google. But fact it's like 90% of financial advisors fail within two years. Like 90% that get in. I don't know if that res- is, yeah. if you've heard that I don't that know before. if it would be quite that high, okay. but it, it's not far off. And it wouldn't be far off from real estate. It, although real estate allows for a lot more part time, uh, whereas financial advisors not so much. Right. Uh, but I have seen a study that equated it to professional sports, to professional athletes, and in that you know you you get your tryout, you might make it, but you could be gone in a very short period of time. So that is the reality, and and really it all does come down to marketing yourself and being able to get out there and prospect, and really that all starts with confidence and. You know, it's not easy to get into the industry with confidence, but if you're in, you better have it and you better grow it and keep it. Wow, man, I agree with you so much. I actually say it's so so often like one of the most 
like the attribute and not positive how to frame this up exactly, but the skill set that a salesman needs almost the most is just confidence. Like you don't have to have the best script, but you have to deliver it with the most confidence. But Dan, tell us about your story, right? Because, you know, you know, we're just getting introduced to you. So introduce yourself to our audience. Let them know kind of your journey, how you got into doing what you're doing. Why are you passionate about coaching advisors? Just kind of bring us up to speed sure. on your journey a little bit. Then we'll dive into this idea of confidence and prospecting and building a business. Right. Well, like many financial advisors, I fell into the business. I had no intention to ever be here. I have degrees in political science and history. Uh, but when I couldn't find jobs as an historian or a politician, I fell into financial services. So about 31 years ago, I got into the business just as the market crashed back in 87. Uh, but luckily, you know, I was getting in a, at a time when a lot of advisors were getting out. So there were a lot of clients that were open for the taking and I was prospecting. And that was the one thing I understood that I had to do right away is prospect. So I prospected hard. Uh, I, eked out a living in my first year. I doubled it in the next two or three years. Nice. And I started to learn what I needed to learn. And ultimately, I got into the management side where I was actually training advisors. And I did that for about 25 years. And then my business partner, Tina Carthageser, and I left that business and started Advice to Advisors back in 2018. So okay. we've been around a long time. <laughs> uh, uh, and and what we do is we, we really continue what we were doing for the last 25 years, which is coach financial advisors. So, you know, obviously you've moved to coaching. Like what are the, you know, walk us through this idea, because the main thing that our, you know, audience wants to know is, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in the business. I wake up every single day. And the thing that's on my mind is how do I retain the clients I have right now? And how do I go out and get new clients? So what would be your approach to a financial advisor in helping them going out and getting new assets and getting new clients? What, what are some of the strategies you would get into coaching them on? Yeah, and even before the actual prospecting strategies, what we lay down is the base level knowledge. You have to know what your business is about. You have to understand your business so that you can actually communicate that to others, and you have to do it with confidence. So the first thing we look to do is what's the structure of your business? You know, is it a personal CFO model where you've got all the experts that can help you help help your clients? Is it the home office where you're where you're, or the family office where you've actually got internal experts working with you. So understand and be able to show your potential clients that model. Give them confidence that it's more than just you, whether you're using uh, anybody internal to the company or external, the attorneys, accountants, money managers, and the lot. Uh, the next thing is really important, and unfortunately, the vast majority of financial advisors don't do this, but it's focus on an ideal client profile. Uh, you've, you've got to have that vision, understand who you're going to deal with, why you're going to deal with, and how you're going to deal with them. Because the more you n narrow focus, the more you have opportunity. Rather than looking at everybody as a potential client, you, you focus on that ideal client profile, and all of a sudden they're everywhere. Uh, that's a big challenge because advisors get very afraid of narrowing. They think they're going to lose opportunity, where right. in fact it really does expand your opportunities, and you become the expert. How does people one, want to work with experts? How does one go about, because I, I agree with you, and, and especially like on the marketing side, it's the same yeah. for if you're going to do a Facebook ad or you're going to do a mail or, yeah. you know, you want to, your target audience, what you're going after, messaging, all that good stuff. How do you go about this who, what, and how? Is it a personal preference? Like, and is it different? I'm assuming it's different for somebody starting out brand new and doesn't have a history versus somebody who has a book of business. But give me a little bit more detail yeah. on how I would go about that. Yeah. And, and I think you need to, to begin with the end in mind, just as Stephen Covey said, look at what you want your business to end up with. But it is very personal. You've got to like the people you're going to work with and work for or it's never going to fly. Uh, for instance, in my first year, I started, I'd take anyone on as a client that I could but then I got my first senior, first retiree, about 10 months into the business. And the moment I had that happen, I realized a couple things. First of all, that's where all the money was. The, the financial planning aspect and the strategic thinking of that was far more interesting, more 
tax implications, more estate planning implications. Uh, so from that day that I got that first client, I just started telling everybody that I was a retirement specialist. And the funny thing <laughs> was, awesome. they believed me. They actually <laughs> believed me to the point where one of our front office staff, an admin staff, came around at 5 p.m. and, and bent over my desk and said, I, I heard you're a, finan- you're a retirement specialist. <laughs> and I looked at her in surprise and I said, well, that's right, I am. And she said, well, my dad died last year and my, my mom doesn't like his advisor. Would you talk to her? Wow. And she became my second retirement client. No way, so that's it's, awesome. It's, it's really, yeah, it's declaring who your ideal client is, who you work for and who you work with and letting everybody know. And then specialize, study that cohort, know them inside and out, because if, if, if it is a cohort, they have similar goals, similar needs, and the technical work is very similar. So it's, it's far easier to become an expert to someone than a generalist to everyone. Mm, that's a golden nugget right there. That is a golden nugget. And, and I've heard you always outsell. You will mm-hmm. always outsell a generalist. Um, so it's, it's so much easier. Yep. Absolutely. They, you know, someone would rather work with a specialist. They'd rather work with someone that works with people like them, right? Uh, the third thing that we, we really try and lay down is the unique value proposition, who you are, what you do, why you do it. And Simon Sinek does this very well when he, in his book you know, about why. You know, why do you work for these people? What is it that drives you to do that? This really gets down to your passion. What is it that makes you want to get up every day and go to work for these people? So get that unique value proposition down on paper. You know, Some people will call it an elevator speech. I don't think that's what it is. It, it needs to be quick. It needs to be specific. But the why, the how, and the what of what your business is all about. And then the fourth area that we focus on is the actual prospecting dashboard that we can talk about, but understanding that you need to know what your prospecting prospecting mechanisms are, how you're going to do them, when you're going to do them, that's going to set you apart, that's going to keep you moving, and finally, process everything. Turn everything that you do into processes, absolutely everything about your business is processes, so that you're not trying to rethink and redo everything time and time again. It becomes second nature. So once you've got those five areas done, then you can get into the actual prospecting, uh, and you'll do it with confidence. And really, we work with four basic methods of, of prospecting, and I was a cold caller when I started because I I came into the business with Nobody. I didn't know anyone that had any money because I've been in university for six years. <laughs> so I had to cold call and I did tens of thousands of cold calls. And I certainly wouldn't train anyone today on cold calls. It's far too difficult. Most people don't have the tenacity to do it. The regulators that are all over it, uh, the do not call <laughs> list will kill you and it'll wear you down. And there's just no need to do it. So we really train to become referable. Never ask for a referral, but become referable, and it's a process, uh, but it's an easy pro- process if you know the process. Secondly, get introductions. Ask for introductions. Asking for a referral, everybody hates. The prospect, the client hates it, the advisor hates it. You know, who do you know that could use my services? Well, when you ask that, you're both uncomfortable. They <laughs> never know. They say they'll, they'll think about it. The moment you leave, they don't think about it. Everybody's forgotten about it, but you're still uncomfortable. So don't ask for referrals. Become referable, but do ask for introductions. Right? You know, uh, you mentioned your your mum was was interested in this or that, or your your coworker. Right? I'd like to introduce myself. How should I do that? Should I do it by email? Should I do it over LinkedIn or Facebook? How would you suggest? Right? So you can get introductions. You can ask for a self introduction. You can have them introduce. But it's it's a a normal, comfortable method of getting to the people, and you're always doing it to your ideal client. When you say, who do you know that can use my services, they might come up with someone that, first of all, can't afford you, that you're not interested in working with because they don't fit your ideal client profile, and it's just a bad fit. But when you're asking for introductions, you're the one driving the name. You're not asking for a name. You're asking for the specific introduction to that specific person. 
Man, the these third are method that we these are incredible. Yeah. I, I want to ask you a question on what becoming referable means before I, I lose that because I, I love I've never heard the spin on asking for introductions versus asking for referrals, mm-hmm. but I love that. I think that yeah, one of the things that I naturally hear as a salesman and when you say that is just it's just natural. It's natural to ask someone mm-hmm. for an introduction versus it's not as natural to ask someone for a referral. Uh, so that's that's I love Absolutely. that spin. But what does it mean to become referable? Yeah, and there's a lot of science behind becoming referable, and it can be done unbelievably quickly. A lot of advisors think, you know, I have to prove myself. Well, you can prove yourself in the moment, right? First thing is, and Robert Cialdini is probably the best to write or to read on on influence, how you influence people. And he suggests, first of all, likability. If they don't like you, you're going nowhere. And there's a number of ways to become likable, you know. Physical attraction is, is, is one of the first ones. So We got that know, one down, don't good. we, Josh? You, no. you do. Oh, you, you know, <laughs> you've got the Hollywood look, but oh, yeah. not everybody does, right? <laughs> no. Right? So, you guys yeah. got to check out our YouTube videos. Yeah. You would be laughing right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry to interrupt, but yes. It's is just smile. And that's not easy for everybody, but, the, but smile is one of the first attractors to most people. Uh, along with that, then highlight your unique value proposition. Whenever you're talking to people, remind them why you work. You know, if you work with doctors, remind them, you know, I do my best work with doctors. I do my best work with engineers. I do my best work with young families, young professionals, things of that nature. But let them know why you do it and how you do it. Mm. Uh, Building trust. Again, people think that building trust takes time, but trust develops over time. But you can shorten the time span by taking them and yourself into their future and talking about we you know when this happens here's what we do next and we'll do this next and then bring them back to the present so you've shown them the future you were there with them man that's a golden nugget right there just introducing it, we instead of you i'm going to help you, you do this I'm or help. i yeah, that's that's, we. that's a golden nugget for the service-based industry because you're, you're working with yeah, somebody if, not for somebody that's, that's right, good. and it's a partnership. Yeah. It's a partnership, and they need that partnership. Uh, one of the areas of that I really like about becoming referable is inspiring people. Uh, and to inspire somebody demands optimism. Uh, Talia Sherrod, a neuroscientist, wrote a great book, uh, The Optimism Bias, and, and she talks about how optimism really does attract people but you can't be overly optimistic. If you're overly optimistic, they think you're insane. <laughs> <laughs> they think you're some crazy clown, around, right? <laughs> right? And the, yeah, they they can't buy into that. So it's it's a moderate optimism. But if you're if you're pessimistic, who wants to be around you? First of all, secondly, who wants you managing the money if you're pessimistic? <laughs> yeah, sure. Right? Other than another pessimist, and those two together, two pessimists will kill any relationship right off the bat. Uh, the next area I would say is make them look good. If if you want somebody to refer someone to you, you have to make sure that you're making that person look good when they do refer. So you have to, you know, what Dan Sullivan of Strategic Coach would say are, are referability traits. Show up on time, do what you say, finish what you start, and say please and thank you, which really means just show gratitude. So if, if you can do all of that, you're showing respect to the person that's been referred to you. And hopefully they're going back to the referrer and saying, you know, I really appreciate you, you know, referring me to Dan. He, he's everything you said he was. You know, he showed up in time. He was this and that. That's if you're not making the referrer look good, your chances of having referrals come to you are limited. Mm. And then finally, constantly advertise your your ideal client. Otherwise, they're not thinking about, about it. But again, if you say, I love working you know, with, with families like yours, I love working with retirees because you know, that is going to generate pictures of people like them in their mind and make you more referable. So if you were, and this is all in my book, Financial Advisor's Guide to Excellence. This is awesome. So if you go through this, it's, it's, it's very easy to wake up every day and go, how do I be referable? Boom, boom, boom. Mm. That's it. And you think about it. 
Nah, man, so I love that not- so much gold. Uh, it reminds me, Bill Good. We had Bill Good on the the podcast. He talks about referral consciousness um, mm-hmm. and creating a referral consciousness, and and it's very similar. You know, this idea that you're not really asking for, for referrals, but you want people to constantly have this referral consciousness about you that you need and want referrals, and you're a referrable, Absolutely. as you would say. That is amazing. So. Becoming referable, asking for introductions, and then I cut you off. You said there was a third prospecting method that you were getting into. Yeah, building a networking group. Okay. Uh, you know, and that's really creating a group of other professionals that work with your ideal clients. So if you work with young professionals, right, who services these young professionals? Well, they may have accountants or tax preparers. They may have attorneys that they need for this and that. You know, it could be IT people, technology people. But creating a group that you can actually sit down with every two weeks, every month, you know, and sharing ideas about these clients, but also sharing introductions or referrals. There's a lot of different groups, what I call commercial networking groups, where you pay to become part of the group. But the problem there is that, you don't know who these individuals are. There's no immediate trust. They may not be dealing with your ideal client in the first place. And it's kind of a hit and miss on whether or not it's going to work out. If you gradually build this networking group of your own and you can f- find these people within your own network, you can find them within your clients' networks if you just ask them, uh, but really source them out, make sure it's a good fit, and build out this group over time, this could be one of the absolute best ways of driving referrals and introductions. And you've got all of these sources that can take care of your clients for the other needs that you don't deal with. You know, it could be a real estate agent who likes to work with seniors or likes to work with professionals, whatever it is, but they become a huge part of your networking service. So you've got so much more to offer than your own services. And really it comes down to the point in a a great line that a financial advisor, a high-end financial advisor, he used to say, or he still does say actually, that anytime there's a dollar sign in front of something, give me a call. (laughs) If it's got anything to do with money, call me. Right? And clients will say, well, if if it might not have anything to do with our investments. Yeah, call me, right? If it's about real estate, call me. I, I'll get you the expert. I'll mm. get you the information. That's so amazing. a networking group, can, yeah, they can give you all this, this firepower to go back to your clients with. Plus, you'll end up cross-pollinating your, your own client bases, and you'll grow organically through that method. Man, that is an amazing golden nugget. It's something that um, here at Reminder Media, we've encouraged people to do. I always think one of the biggest misses that small businesses make is they don't network with other small businesses that are in the same industries in a sense of like they're working with similar clientele, but they're not competitive. Absolutely. And there's such a syner- right. synergy there. There's such a synergy and you can, synergy. you can market together, you can cross pollinate databases together, you can put on Definitely. community events together, you can do charity work together. I mean, it is just amazing how many small businesses miss that opportunity. So I think that's an amazing- yeah, They become huge nugget. resources, right? Yeah, you, you know, if you have a group of six to eight other professionals, suddenly you've got this firepower that, you know, you're, you're not competing any longer against other financial advisors. You're just winning because you're, you're at a, a different level than the average financial advisor. Mm. No, nah, man, I, I, I mean, I've taken so many notes right here. I, Josh, I don't know if you're taking, <laughs> I've taken so many notes, man. You've yeah, given man. so many good practical things for people to do. I'm curious Let's say I'm a financial advisor that gets into the business right now. So I'm starting out, I'm getting into the business. What do you tell me, like, how do I go about becoming referable when I have no clients? Like, how do I build a networking group when I know no businesses? Are you literally, like, are you saying I should just go knock on their door? Like, how would I do that? Like, walk me through kind of your... Cliff Notes version of, okay, Luke, you just got started and you're joining LPL Financial and this is where you're going to be or whatever it is that I'm joining. Can you give me kind of a glimpse of these are amazing tips, but how do I execute them when I have nothing? I'm literally just in the business. Sure. Uh, First of all, try and figure out your ideal client as quickly as possible. 
And that may take a few months, but it shouldn't take long. Again, begin with the end in mind. Know where you want to end, who you want to be working with. Uh, once you do that, so, you know, if, again, like myself, I want to deal with retirees and I know you two, you don't fit the retiree bill for me, but I'm going to talk something technical that your parents or even grandparents or uncles and aunts need. You know, I just might ask you something, you know, do you know if your folks know about this, the 401k, this, okay. you know, anything of that nature, I'll, I'll ask a technical question that I know you can't answer, hmm. you know, on their behalf. And then I'll say, you know, do you think they'd be interested in that information? And it's got to be a question where you're going to say, well, yeah, I would think so. And again, I'd say, you know, well, I can send them some information. Would they prefer to get it by email or paper mail? All right. So I can, I'm going through you. You become my introduction or referral source. I send them the information. Then I connect with them and say, you know, your son asked me to send this information to you. Can you take, take a few moments to read over it? I'll give you a call tomorrow. Yeah. He's a master. That's he's a, good. he's That's a master. <laughs> well, so many people will say, oh, so, they don't fit within my, my, my profile that I yep. built. So they'll ignore them and move on. And that's just understanding the connections. What what what's going to connect me to that person to that my ideal client my niche yeah yep. yeah. yeah yeah we uh, but, but it immediately it immediately lets you off the hook you thought I was going to try and prospect right. you but I don't even talk about you yep yeah that's right? amazing but you will ultimate you'll become my client anyways because we're going to do intergenerational yep. planning I'm involved with your parents I'm going to deal with you ultimately you're going to come back to me or I'm going so to come smart. to you talking about what your parents do um, <laughs> but another great way to build a business, and you mentioned White Glove, and I'm a big fan of White Glove. Uh, I'm not paid by White Glove, but they're the one company over the 30 years that I've found that's in the marketing and prospecting business for advisors that actually do what they say. Mm. And they, you know, they guarantee that they'll fill a room or you don't pay for anyone that's not there. I love that aspect. Mm. Uh, but I think seminars are a fantastic way to go about building a business for a couple of reasons. And those reasons have everything to do with how I built my business. Uh, I was shy in university. Yeah, I wasn't the guy that stood up and answered questions. But when I had to make a living, I knew I, I would do anything I needed to do. I started working with other financial advisors who would do seminars, so I'd partner with them. Ultimately, I got a little more comfortable to the point where I could do specialized seminars to my target market. Uh, I actually brought in some professors that, that talk publicly as well, and to the point where they actually brought me in, and I've been teaching at business school at York University for the last 21 years, and that came about purely by seminars. But when you're doing seminars, people pursue perceive you as the expert. Now, the one caveat here is you better be, <laughs> right? You can't be up there <laughs> void of knowledge. So the seminars you do need to be to your targeted ideal client. The information, you have to be the expert, and mm. that's not that tough. Have fun doing it. Have passion doing it, but it'll draw people to you. It, you'll, you'll become a real magnet for the right type of clients by doing these seminars. No, I totally agree. We have been had the privilege of working with White Glove and have said they do seminars, obviously, for those, you know, wondering if you're listening to this, you guys should check them out. And it's all about, you know, they fill a room and then allow you to do your thing and build the not only the authority, you get a position of authority because you're the expert. But then, you know, I even say more importantly, the relationship. And you get to start yeah. building a relationship with that person and come in and then obviously you want an appointment with them and then turn that appointment into a client, but that ability to build a relationship. So what I love right. about some of the stuff that you've said, which is, you know, it's so similar and obviously I don't, you know, this is the first time I've met you, but you have so many similar core beliefs to, to what I believe about building a business where it's this idea of becoming referable and that's the main way you're going to build your business. And and the way you do that is you have to start with the relationship you have. And I think your unique spin, which I think is super important that I want the audience to catch, is that so many of us are afraid to ask our friends for business because it feels awkward. You don't want to be the insurance salesman that's always selling insurance to your friends or the financial advisor. But the way you spun it was so good of asking a technical question that you know they won't understand and it's to get you to your ideal client 
is so awesome. And I want everybody to take note of that that's listening to this and try that literally this week. Like ask a technical question. Yeah. Uh, well, you can do it in real estate. It applies to real estate. It applies to insurance. And applies, totally. I mean, it could apply to yeah. security companies. I mean, it, it really is something you can ask a technical Absolutely. question to get to your ideal client. I love that. Yeah. So being referable, asking for introductions, building a networking group and building seminars, any other prospecting, you know, that you guys tend to coach on? No, actually. Those are the you four know, areas. We, yeah, because you you really want to be good at what you do in all aspects of your yep. business. And it's not that those are the only ones. You know, if you're a cold caller and you're good at it, keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just wouldn't coach someone new to it because it's too tough. Mm. But I believe you need a minimum of three to four prospecting methods now, again, referrals isn't true prospecting. I've got to become referable. And what the research shows is a lot of my clients are going to refer people to me, but 60 to 80% of the time, I'm never going to hear from them because something happened in between. They just didn't contact me. But I need to be referable. But the more I, ref- I work the referability process, they're going to come to me. But if I can't count on that growing my business, and the reality is, and unfortunately too many senior advisors don't recognize this reality, if you're not growing, you're dying. Yes. You know, your business is going down. It, it doesn't flatline. It goes down. Your AUM goes down. Revenue goes down. You know, your client's feelings about you go down. When you're in growth mode, you're operating at top efficiencies and everybody feels it and yep. it, it just creates its own juggernaut. But when you let your foot off the pedal, when you stop prospecting, stop marketing, everything dies. Yes. And it's unfortunate because that, you know, the, the passion you had for your business starts dying itself and it's, it's just a pitfall. So if you've got enough methods of prospecting that you enjoy, you know, not everybody should be doing seminars. Not everybody can be good at it. Right. So find something else other than that. But if you're good at it, do it and become great at it. Become great at introductions. I I actually was at a workshop in Chicago and I was talking to a five-year industry uh, advisor and I said, do you ever do seminars? And he, he looked at me as though I was an alien and he pulled a stack of business cards out of his pocket a fistful, and he said, why would I ever do seminars? These are all the introductions I got today. Oh. This, guy, this guy's, all, he's only that been guy's a business. stud. No. Oh, he's all major league stud. He's only been in the business five years, and this guy's whipping me on why should I be doing anything else. That's crazy. He, That's amazing. He was, he was that good at it, and – yeah, he found something blessed. he was passionate about. Yeah, he it's so, about yeah. You got it. You have to enjoy the prospecting. You know, they say always be closing. It's really always be prospecting. Um, you know, if always. you're always prospecting, the closes will a lot of times take care of themselves. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if you're always prospecting, I would also note for the audience listening is I think a lot of times we get confused when we hear the word referrals. We think of it in terms of we have to have a really strong relationship with that person and they referred us. I like to talk about it in terms of you have your referrals that come from your clients, your past clients, but you also have what we call your sphere of influence. You don't underestimate the power of your sphere of influence and you've never worked with them before and you're really building, when you think of it from a marketing side, you're, you're building a brand. Like one of the things that I see with successful business owners, especially small business owners, is they do a really good job of what you're talking about, which is they understand their ideal client, they understand their unique differentiator, what their passion is of why they're doing what they're doing, and then they brand the heck out of it. They're talking exactly. about it always. They put it everywhere. And, and what that does is that's what creates that referral consciousness and what creates that, you know, where people want to come and use you because there's that energy that starts happening yeah. from building that powerful brand. So it's like you have referrals, but don't underestimate your sphere of influence. So One of the questions I have, what's the biggest pain point you're seeing in the industry right now with financial advisors? Where 
Where are they really tripping up? Because technology is changing. I mean, things are going crazy, especially in the financial world because of compliance. Like, how do you use social media in a compliance-driven world? It's so difficult. So, like, what's the biggest pain point right now the industry is facing? Yeah, and there's so many pain points right now. And you you said it, regulators, compliance, everything, you know – it's it's like the bean counters have taken over the <laughs> industry so that that you know it's true you know, anything that anything that's interesting or fun about marketing you know compliance is trying to snuff the life right out yep. of it unfortunately so yeah you've got to work with them and the reality is if if you take it seriously and look at what your compliance is all about Use your compliance, right? You, you can't fight it because you'll be out of the industry. They'll have your licenses. Uh, so you've got to work with them. But but do it in a way that, you know, you, you're, you're pushing the ceiling but not going beyond it. Uh, uh, but compliance is huge. It's, it's, a, it's a sore spot for so many. But if you let it become, you know, it's going to fester and it's going to kill your business. So work with it great point. and work within the confines of that. Uh, Definitely squeezing of fees is, is becoming problematic, but it's, it's really only problematic to those that aren't growing their business. The, the advisors that know where they're going, don't let their foot off the pedal, prospecting continuously, they're just taking other people's clients. So they, they could be driving up their assets under management. They can be driving up their revenue. Yes, everything's getting squeezed, but they're just becoming better at what they do. So, you know, maybe per client the revenue is going down, but they're getting bigger and better and more clients. So they're the ones that are, are not only surviving, but they're thriving. And and that's always been true. You know, it was true 30 years ago when I got into the industry. It's it's those that just don't let the noise get them down. And there is so much noise. But that's that goes back to that inspiring and that op- optimism. If if you want to be in the industry put your head down, work like a dog. You're always going to do it. And that's the one thing about the top financial advisors. And I've studied them, you know, across North America and a bit in Europe. Uh, They never stop working. They Mm. work hard, but they work hard because they love to work, right? So many advisors or people get into the advisory business thinking, you know, I want to, I want to become referral only business. Well, that's not easy. And to get to that point, you work hard, right? But but those that are really good at this business, they like doing the other things anyways. They like doing seminars, and they don't want to give it up. They love their networking group, and they won't give that up ever. They like asking for introductions, and they're always refining the referability, right? And that will push beyond any of the, the pain points, right, if you're passionate. And research shows that within passion, the more you focus on what you can be good or great in, the more passionate you become about it. The more passionate you become, the more optimistic you become, and the more you draw people towards you. And what you're doing is you're drawing that ideal client to you. Business becomes easier. It's never easy. It's never been easier. Uh, you know, I hear industry veterans saying, you know, it was easier in the 80s. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't easier in the 90s. It wasn't easier in the 2000s. It's a tough business. But those that succeed, Amen. succeed yeah. because, yeah, they're optimistic. They're focused. They do what they love. They help a lot of people. And they just keep doing it. Mm. Man, you are such a wealth of knowledge, man. You you have so, – I'm so impressed. This is the first time, guys, I've actually Thank had you. the privilege of meeting Dan. I'm so impressed with, you know, just – guys, I would encourage you, listen back to this podcast again because I took notes in front of me and I have a ton of the points he wrote down. And he is giving you – from my experience, so, you know, we've built a $40 million business here. And, you know, we're in a different industry than Dan. But in my experience, the principles and the process that he just walked through is the same for our business. And when Josh Mm -hmm. and I are talking about the future of Reminder Media, you know, so many of the times when we get into the thick of it with the issues we're having, we always go back to we we don't have an infrastructure problem. We have a sales problem. We have a prospecting problem because sales solves all pain. And it's just like so many of the principles, man, that you've talked about is is amazing. So I have a question for you because we're getting to the end of the, you know, time here with the podcast. But I want to know, you know, everybody's looking for the magic formula for success. Now, we know it doesn't exist. But I'm curious, mm-hmm. you've been successful in your life. You've built a business right. and, and now you have this other business you're building and just listening to you. What's the routine that you've done in your life that's really driven both personal and professional success for you? 
Yeah, I would say the one thing I do every single day is I look into the future. I don't look backwards. Uh, I don't find a lot of fun in looking backwards. It, it's been done. You know, maybe it worked well, maybe it didn't, but it's it's past. So I'm, I I like to look forward, and I like to look forward with optimism. And I set goals, and I I try to set realistic goals. Sometimes they're not very realistic. <laughs> And quite often my business partner or my spouse will rein me in a bit, but I try and push those goals as far as I can. And then I work towards them. It's it, that's the reality of any business, right? You set your goals, you work towards them. Uh, you know, don't be limited on your goals. Mm-hmm. It, you, you can self confine your goals or you can let others do it. But you know, if you're optimistic enough, if you're passionate enough goals, you attain them, you make new ones, you move on. Mm-hmm. So what would you go back and tell your younger self? What would you go back and tell that young kid? What advice would you give? This is our deep question of the podcast. Yeah, yeah probably one of the, the best things I learned was to turn everything into a process. Because prior to making everything, and when I wrote my first book, that's what it was all about. I spent five years writing it because I hadn't processed everything yet. Yeah. But I turned every, you know, I turned tax planning into a process, retirement planning into a process, estate planning into a process. But then what was the most important was every aspect of prospecting that I was ever going to deal with, I turned it into a process. And then it was just, you know, tick mm. off the boxes. Yeah. I've done this, this, and this. And it's, that's what makes life easy. Yeah, when you turn things into a process, when things become repeatable, they become scalable. Well, it frees up your mind for more creative totally. things and to move on to to be able to visualize that future and then move towards it. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Well, it thank, certainly does. Thank you so much for being here, Dan. Before we close, let people know where they can uh, connect with you. Let them know about uh, Advice to Advisors, your book, anything that you want to give information on there. Sure, sure. You can, you can look at our website at... at advice to advisors.com you can get a hold of and me that's at the number Daniel. two right Collison. advice to number two advisors.com yeah awesome. numeral two yep right uh and my email daniel.collison at advice to advisors.ca okay and any questions by all means now can can people still get your book because i'm looking on amazon it's like 150 dollars on amazon <laughs> yeah do not <laughs> do not buy it on amazon <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah you you can it Carswell was the original publisher, and it's uh, taken like, over by. Okay. By, um, There's like one company, one, one copy left, I guess. Well, I will tell you guys yeah. this. <laughs> I'm, I guarantee you, if it's filled with this information, it's worth way more than 150 bucks. I haven't read it, but I'm going to go read it. I mean, it's. <laughs> I, I'm guaranteeing you. $45 it, from yeah. the publisher. There nice. you go. Awesome. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here again, and thank you for listening. If you like what you heard today on Stay Paid, you can do one of three things. All right. Or you can do all all three. Or you can do all three. Give us a rating on iTunes. Yes, five stars, please. (laughs) Let someone else know about the podcast. I can't think of the third. And and tell your mom, tell your brothers, tell your sisters. Go on YouTube and give this video a thumbs up. My mom's probably my biggest fan, ladies and gentlemen. So tell your mom. I don't think so. Andrea's mom is. is, Oh, Andrea's (laughs) mom is competing with my mom. I'm going to tell my mom that. (laughs) If you follow us on social media and see Barbara Judson Tremper. Yes. That's Andrea's mom. We love the support. You can also find this video in podcast uh, or in video form, this podcast <laughs> on video form in youtube.com slash reminder media. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of me or Luke, please email us at podcast or reminder media.com. You can also find us on Instagram or LinkedIn. And of course, you can check out reminder media on social media. We are at reminder media for this episode of stay paid. I'm Joshua Stike. Guys, and I'm Luke Acree. And like I said, I'm just amazed by all the content that was delivered on this podcast. It is 100% worth a re-listen to because I, I guess because it connects so much with my heart and how it's been building Reminder Media and our clients' businesses and the experiences I've had there. I know, and I can say with 100% certainty, we just walk through the formula to helping you be successful in business. There are specific tactics to each of these you know, bullet points we went through that you can probably find more information about. But I would tell you guys one of the greatest tips I heard from this. I want you to practice this week because Stay Paid is all about putting into action some of the things that you took away. So ask for an introduction this week and do that by asking a technical question to somebody you know that maybe is not your ideal client 
And just like he said, whether it's about retirement or taxes or whatever, and then ask for an introduction to that person. I love that little spin on instead of asking for a referral, ask for an introduction. I think that's so natural in a human, you know, just process standpoint. So try that this week. Remember that the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer in any business is top producers take action. So take action on that tip today. 